Hey guys, and welcome back. If you are new around here, I cover mostly Australian cases, and today we are talking about what happened to 15-year-old Jessica Small, and why this is possibly one of the most bungled investigations I have ever looked into. But first, we have a sponsor, which is incredibly exciting, because as you guys know, it's the sponsors that help keep this channel running. So today, I'm incredibly grateful to Skillshare for supporting my content and working with me for the second time. So for those that don't know, Skillshare is an online learning community offering classes in anything you can possibly imagine. Photography, drawing, marketing, organizing skills, gardening, writing, languages, interior design, and that is really just scratching the surface. I personally enjoy looking for classes that can help me improve my life, teach me something valuable, and help me grow as a person. That means I am often looking for classes that will assist me in making this YouTube channel better and better. And my favorite class that I've completed recently is called Presentation Skills, How to Share Ideas That Inspire Action by Simon Sinek. Simon's class is about discussing what you're passionate about, i.e. talking about Aussie crime and relaying it to whoever may be listening in an effective and inspiring manner. And I think a class like this is not only helpful to professional speakers or a YouTuber, but anyone that interacts with, well, anyone. We're constantly interacting with people in our everyday lives, telling stories and presenting ideas. And this class really shows you how to apply Simon's presenting tips to many, many aspects of your life. I think one of my favorite things about this class, and this applies to so many classes on Skillshare, is that it's a 30 minute class broken down into six lessons. So if you have a busy life, which we all do, you can do any classes on Skillshare in bite-sized chunks. And for someone with a super short attention span like myself, that is a lifesaver. And after you complete a class, you can interact in the Skillshare community, discuss what you've learned, and even take part in class projects, which is something I think makes Skillshare so incredibly unique and enjoyable. Having said that, Skillshare is giving away two free months of a premium membership to help you explore your creativity, whatever that may be, when you click the link down in my description box and after that it's only around ten dollars a month which i think is an incredible price for how much you get out of this so please consider checking out skillshare this is a service i use myself and love i would not recommend something to you guys that i don't personally use and approve of and by supporting them you're supporting the content on this channel so having said all of that, let's get straight into today's case. So we're heading back to October of 1997 in Bathurst, New South Wales, which is approximately 200 kilometers or 124 miles west northwest of Sydney. And Bathurst is a pretty small Australian city with a population of around 37,000. One of which used to be a 15 year old girl named Jessica Small. Jessica was born on July 27, 1982 in Perth, Western Australia, right here where I'm from, to her parents Ricky and Stephen Small. And she also had two older siblings, Rebecca and Matthew. Her parents separated when Jessica was just two years old and this is when her mother took Jessica and her two siblings to live all the way over the other side of the country in Bathurst. By 1997, Jessica was kind of living from place to place because of tensions at home, from what I could understand from my research. She sometimes lived with her mother, sometimes her sister, and she also had a few friends that she stayed with. She also had a pretty large circle of friends, and one of her closest friends was a girl named Vanessa Conlon, whom I believe was around the same age as Jessica, and someone I'll be discussing a little more in a moment. So according to Vanessa, Jessica and her mother fought a fair amount, 
over pretty typical things. Money, sneaking out, wanting to go to parties that she wasn't allowed to attend, and Jessica would apparently get quite frustrated at this because some days it seemed like her mother didn't care what she did and other days her mother was trying to force rules on her. Another point of contention according to Vanessa was the fact that Jessica's mum would often blow the grocery money or the food money for the week on alcohol, leaving no food in the house for Jessica to eat. Now, around April or May of 1997, Jessica dropped out of year 10 at Kelso High School. And after dropping out of school, Jessica's life became pretty unstructured. She didn't have a job and she was living from place to place, as I said. So Saturday, October 25, 1997 was like any other day for Jessica. She was hanging out with her friend Vanessa and that evening they decided to walk into town to catch up with friends. On their way they saw Jessica's mother, Ricky, who gave her some spending money. The pair walked into the Amuse Me Amusement Centre on Russell Street in the Bathurst CBD. So from what I can gather, the Amuse Me Centre was some kind of popular video game arcade at the time. When I googled it, nothing really came up, but it's not super relevant to the story, so let's keep going. During the night, the pair left Amuse Me to get some food at Mix Takeaway, but soon returned to the center where Jessica had a few alcoholic drinks and was said to be a little tipsy, but not drunk. The pair were also there with a number of other friends where they spent the night playing pool and dancing. And Jessica and Vanessa did leave Amuse Me a few more times that night, at one point looking for a friend, but ultimately ended up back at the amusement center, only to find that by the time they returned, it had closed for the night. The pair then headed to a nearby restaurant to discuss whether they should just go home and go to sleep or go out and do something else and they decided to keep going with their night. They started walking towards the friend's place a few kilometers away on Hereford Street. And as the girls were walking, they noticed the car pass them, turn around and then park on the opposite side of the road. And as the pair had hitchhiked before, they decided to investigate. Jessica had a brief conversation with the driver before she and Vanessa got into the vehicle, which was a pretty common, unremarkable white sedan or possibly Holden Commodore. Unremarkable except for one small detail, that is, which I'll come back to in just a moment. So neither Jessica nor Vanessa knew the driver previously, Although in the brief conversation Jessica had with the male stranger, he indicated that he had seen them at the Amuse Me Centre earlier that night. Now around the same time, and correct me if I am wrong because I was not quite a teenager in 1997, but my thought is that hitchhiking was still pretty popular, particularly in a small city like Bathurst that I reckon back then at least, would have had more of a small country town feel. Everyone likely knew each other, everyone probably was pretty friendly. Again, not my era or my area, so correct me down in the comments below if I'm wrong on these assumptions or if you're from that area. And furthermore, Jessica and Vanessa were hitchhiking together. Who doesn't feel completely safe doing something a little more risky with a friend? In a situation like this, it almost feels like nothing bad can happen. So with Vanessa in the front and Jessica in the back, the trio drove away. And this was a fairly remote area at the time, I should add. So nobody witnessed the two friends getting into the car. The girls are asked to be dropped off at their friend's place on Hereford Street which the driver agreed to. However, as he began driving up Hereford Street, he started to slow down in a dark and quiet area, several hundred meters from their friend's home, and turned off the car's headlights. The man then turned to Jessica in the back and said, right, come here, causing Vanessa to say, I don't think so. In retaliation to this remark, the driver put his hands around Vanessa's throat, 
but let go when he saw Jessica trying to escape the vehicle. At this point, he lunged at Jessica. And the struggle continued as the two girls desperately tried to escape the vehicle and escape whatever fate that the man had in store for them. At around 12.40 a.m., Vanessa managed to break free from the vehicle and ran for her life, screaming for help, hearing Jessica's screams for help right behind her. She then ran to the closest home, banging on the windows, waking up the residents and eventually alerting police. But the only problem was that Jessica hadn't managed to escape. When Vanessa did, Jessica was still in the vehicle. And when Vanessa made her run for freedom, the mystery man took off with Jessica in the car, screaming for her life. When Vanessa ran, she had just assumed her friend was close behind her, judging by how loud and how close the screams had seemed, but she was too terrified to ever turn back and look. Jessica's screams that Vanessa heard had been her screams as she was being abducted. The white-coloured vehicle was last seen by witnesses that night near Juramana Road and Willot Close in Eglinton, which is, according to Google Maps, about a nine-minute car drive from where Jessica was abducted and it was said to be heading in the direction of Hill End which is a town about one hour north from where they started. So let's talk a bit about what you will soon realize is one heck of a mess of an investigation. I think we can all agree that the police had one singular but one really good witness to the abduction. And that was Vanessa. She was right there. She could have given police the most detailed information about the car, about the mystery man, but problem was that at the time, police didn't believe her story. You see, Jessica, Vanessa and their group of friends were considered troubled teens by authorities. They'd all had a few small run-ins with the police, but when a 15 year old girl tells you that she was attacked and her friend was abducted, maybe at least hear her out. And this was despite the fact that she was incoherent, crying, trembling and terrified and took about five or six minutes to calm down to the point in which she was coherent enough to tell her version of events to the police. And this was according to an investigator present at the time. To add to this, Vanessa's version of events never wavered throughout the entire investigation. When a 15 year old is lying, it can be pretty hard for them to keep track of their story or keep their story straight. And that's me speaking from experience. So instead of believing Vanessa or investigating her claims, police came up with their own theory of what had happened to Jessica that night. They thought that Vanessa's story was basically a ruse, a cover up for Jessica running away from her mother whom she'd been having a few issues with, as I mentioned at the start of the video. And there was literally nothing else to back up this runaway theory. Nothing. And now we're going to talk about the number of reports that came through to police from members of the public very shortly after and even on the night of Jessica's abduction that involved witnesses witnessing suspicious activity at Amuse Me, suspicious activity with a white Commodore and even one person that says they witnessed the abduction right by their home. But of course, police were so set on their runaway theory, they ignored almost every witness account for an entire decade. So let's start with Colin Cole. He was one of the witnesses that phoned police shortly after Jessica's abduction to report what he said was a dirty white car, which he believed to be a Commodore flying down the road at full speed with its headlights off in the early hours of the morning in which Jessica had been abducted. He said he was on Sydney Road when the car came out from a street on his left, causing him to have to brake so hard that his car stalled. And he said another vehicle that was in the path of this crazy driver had to veer onto the wrong side of the road to avoid being hit. Unfortunately, Cole could not quite make out the driver 
the registration or see if the car had any passengers. And it would not be until 2011 that an official statement would be taken from him, meaning vital details were probably forgotten. And you're about to see that taking official statements more than a decade later is a running trend in this investigation. Another report came into police from Diane Edmonds, who stated that a car went down a never used bush track near her house that led to a creek on the morning that Jessica disappeared. And although Edmonds could not make out the model of the car in the darkness of the night, she said she had never seen a car head down that way, and certainly not in the early hours of Sunday morning. And similar to Colin Cole, Diane Edmonds did not give an official police statement regarding the incident until 2012. 11-year-old Kayla Bryan would also tell her mother a piece of information that may have been connected to Jessica's disappearance. Kayla was approached by a man in Bathurst on the same night Jessica went missing, and although I don't have any details of what he did or said, Kayla did tell her mother a few days after the incident. And when her mother realised it may be connected to the Jessica Small disappearance, she reported it to the police. Then possibly one of the most significant witness accounts came from a man named Robert Fitzpatrick, who says that he witnessed the actual abduction about 30 to 40 metres or 100 to 130 feet from his home. So at around 1am, Fitzpatrick saw what he believed to be a white Holden Commodore or possibly a white Chimera parked just metres from his home in Eglinton. He then witnessed a struggle or a scuffle from inside the vehicle and heard a woman's panicked scream and a shout for help. The driver of the car then got out of the vehicle to open the boot or trunk and search for something. He then heard a little bang and saw the driver kneel over the front seat and then reach over the back seat before driving away. Fitzpatrick attempted to take a mental note of the number plate but didn't end up writing it down as he could not find a pen. He did, however, believe the number plate could have been from either Queensland or Canberra. And although he didn't manage to get a glimpse of the driver's face, he described him as a not very big man, aged between about 30 and 40. So after Fitzpatrick heard about the disappearance of Jessica Small, he went to the police station to report what he had witnessed, and police took his contact details, telling him they'd be in touch, but Fitzpatrick never heard back from them. He then went back to the police station after their radio silence to talk to a detective, but once again he was pretty much ignored, which led him to strongly believe that police simply had no desire to take a statement from him for whatever reason, a reason I still don't understand. It would not be until 2007 that a detailed statement would be taken from Fitzpatrick, 10 whole years later, after a strike force was formed called Strike Force Carica 2 to reinvestigate Jessica's disappearance. And I will be talking more about Carica 2 as we progress through this case. And as with all of the other witnesses, you can only imagine how much information would have been forgotten from the time of the events they witnessed to the time an official statement was taken. In the years following Jessica's disappearance, some evidence was discovered in the Denolan State Forest that could have possibly been connected to her case. Some forestry workers found women's underwear and a blanket but 12 months later, this evidence was destroyed by police. Despite its potential connections to Jessica's case and no real testing being done on the items. And Jessica's family were not even informed of the discovery of these items until after they were destroyed even though they could have possibly identified them. The final witness I'll be telling you about 
is an employee of the Amuse Me Amusement Centre who had been working on the night in question. So William Ross came forward and told police a mystery man had been lurking around the arcade the evening Jessica was abducted who took a pretty keen interest in her. The mystery man told Ross he worked for the Auburn Timber Mill before pointing to Jessica and saying, who's that? She looks like she's out for a good time. And Ross told him that's Jess. Ross said the man looked to be in his mid thirties, was around five, eight inches tall, Australian, with a beer belly and dark hair. And he'd been wearing jeans and running shoes that night with a long sleeved button up cowboy style type shirt or flannelette. But of course, as with all the other witness accounts, this one was also ignored. And on top of that, not one person that was present at Amuse Me that night was ever questioned by police. And an official statement would not even be obtained from William Ross until 2008, 11 years later. Meaning, as I've repeated time and time again, vital information was likely forgotten. And in fact, police had to publicly ask William Ross to come forward all those years later, as it appeared they had never even taken down his personal details for future reference. From Ross's witness account, police narrowed in on two men. One was Craig Robertson, who I'll discuss in a moment. The other was a man named Andrew McBride. And McBride not only fit the description that Ross had given to police and had worked at the Auburn Timber Mill, but records that show McBride, who was visiting Bathurst on Sunday, October 26, left the area in the early hours of the morning. The morning Jessica disappeared. McBride had been staying in some kind of accommodation in Bathurst and drove to Sydney where I believe he lived, which is just under a three hour drive. In fact, it appeared he had pretty much hightailed it back to Sydney because he didn't even manage to remember to hand back his accommodation key. McBride claimed he wasn't in the Bathurst area at this time and in fact, he initially told investigators he'd never even been to Bathurst, telling them for the life of him he could not remember being there. But his own bank records presented to him stated otherwise. After this, McBride suddenly seemed to remember he may have been to Bathurst two or three times to front the Bathurst court, relating to charges of assault and passing fake checks. McBride maintains his innocence to this day, and as of recording this video, although I believe he is still a person of interest, he has not been charged with anything relating to Jessica's disappearance. Now let's talk about the second person of interest in Jessica's case, and that is Craig Robertson. A witness also told police around the time Jessica disappeared that their former workmate, Craig Robertson, disposed of his white Holden Commodore. And similar to McBride, a few other key points that made Robertson look like a person of interest are the fact he was working at the Auburn Timber Mill. He had potentially been in the Bathurst area when Jessica disappeared and he fit the general description of the man eyeballing Jessica at the Amuse Me Centre on the night in question. He also possibly left Bathurst just after Jessica disappeared. He had a history of violence towards women and he had no alibi for the night of Jessica's disappearance. Again, Robertson is simply a person of interest, as is McBride. They are not suspects and they have not been charged and they both maintain their innocence. In a 2014 inquest for Jessica's case, the final findings stated that while there was no direct evidence to link either McBride or Robertson, there is also no evidence to eliminate either of them as persons of interest. So I'll leave that at that. So the distinctive detail I mentioned earlier in the video about the vehicle was a hole in the passenger side footwell, which of course was information that came from Vanessa, who said that the hole was so significant she could see the road whiz by underneath them as they drove along. 
But unfortunately to this day, the vehicle that Jessica and Vanessa got into that night has never been located. It's a bit of a stretch, but if anyone watching this video knew anyone from really anywhere in New South Wales that had a white colored Commodore or similar with a pretty significant hole in the passenger side footwell, it might be worth taking this information to the police. I'll leave the Crime Stoppers information down below and on screen if by any chance you know anything. Police believe it's likely the car was stolen and or unregistered and investigators have looked at around 100 cars forensically examining 5 of them but nothing has resulted from this. And it's also worth noting that in 1997, the areas which I've mentioned throughout this video, where the car was spotted on the night Jessica vanished, had been mostly unsealed roads, as it was still a fairly remote area. Therefore, it's likely that the perpetrator was local and knew the area, knew the streets and knew the towns nearby. So it's clear to me and I'm sure to you as well that investigators had tunnel vision in this investigation set on their theory of troubled teen plans a runaway makes up a cover story end of. Such an easy way for investigators to just brush off Jessica's disappearance. It actually somewhat reminds me of the Ursula Barwick case I covered recently. A uh, troubled teen went missing but police pretty much ignored it because she was, you know, a young troubled teen. And there's actually been a small handful of sightings of Jessica in New South Wales over the years which police have followed up but none have been confirmed. She also had no money, no credit cards and no belongings with her on the night she vanished. I think it would be incredibly difficult for her to run away and start a brand new life at such a young age. I also don't think it would make sense that she would drag a friend into this and force her to tell such a dramatic story to the police and then keep this secret for so long. And another point to consider was that because of the fact that Vanessa had been initially dismissed by investigators, it likely made Jessica's circle of friends, some of whom were already known to the police, dubious of coming forward with any information. It was not until the formation of Strike Force Character 2 in 2007, 10 years after Jessica's initial disappearance, that someone was put in charge of the investigation. And that was Detective Sergeant Peter Smith. Until then, no one person had been in charge of this case. No one to direct or navigate through the mess that had been created. And thankfully, Detective Sergeant Smith and his strike force did believe that Jessica had been abducted and believed Vanessa's version of events. The original and bizarre runaway theory was thrown out the window. I honestly just can't imagine how this case could have possibly been bungled up anymore. So let's go over a few of the key things that have happened since the formation of Carica 2. In 2011, Carica 2 took information that Amuse Me employee William Ross had provided them and tracked down every man between the age of 18 and 30 who had been working at the timber mill near Bathurst in 1997 but nothing resulted from this. The following year in 2012, a dig was finally conducted with police acting on, well, old information from a witness that had seen a white Holden Commodore on the night of Jessica's abduction sitting in one spot for a prolonged period of time. The witness call was made on the night Jessica was abducted but was never connected to her disappearance until Carica 2 took over and dug a little deeper. An area near Fish River off O'Connell Road, O'Connell, about halfway between Bathurst and Auburn, was excavated but unfortunately after two days, nothing of Jessica was found. In 2014, a coronial inquest into Jessica's disappearance found that Jessica had been a victim of foul play. The coroner commented in the days and weeks following Jessica's abduction, their assumptions and prejudice compromised the investigation, 
causing immeasurable additional distress and hurt to the family of Jessica and may have also put other future lives at risk. It was also acknowledged by the Council for New South Wales Police during the inquest that they had, well, basically screwed up the investigation, likely due to the views of investigators at the time. Also during the inquest, it was alleged by the mother of a 15-year-old girl that Andrew McBride, whom I mentioned before as being a person of interest, had a thing for her teenage daughter, McBride being 37 at the time. She claimed he was touchy-feely with her daughter. And this piece of information doesn't particularly prove anything, but I thought it was worth mentioning. The coroner recommended that no less than a $500,000 reward be offered for information leading to solving Jessica Small's case. So in 2015, the New South Wales government announced a $100,000 reward for the case a rather disappointing result after what had been recommended. But thankfully in 2018, the reward was increased to $1 million. And this case is still ongoing and still being investigated by Strike Force Carica 2. And the only real worry I have in this case, in Jessica's case, is was Carica 2 formed a decade too late? to find any real answers. Again, I'll leave the Crime Stoppers information below and on screen now. And thank you so much for being here and listening to Jessica's story. Like, comment, share, subscribe. And thank you so much to my channel members. Your names will be on screen now. I appreciate your support so much. Until next time, stay vigilant and stay safe. And I will see you soon. Bye, guys.